All right, time for another edition of Fighting for the Faith. Was out of town. What, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Seems like an eternity ago, an eon ago. It's kind of one of the joys of uh, having two jobs. (laughs) One that pays the bills and the other one that you get to pay to do. (laughs) All right. Well, we're back. So we've got... We've got some good stuff that we're going to be tackling today. A lot happened while I was out. Uh, Rick Warren has been out on the uh, the plug his new book circuit. And uh, the best way I can describe it is it seems like every time Rick Warren leaves uh, Lake Forest and heads out to New York City or heads out to go on his book tour to promote and plug his book uh, or books or his latest thinking or whatever he's up to, he leaves kind of a wake of destruction in his path. And what we're going to do today is something that's almost a little bit unfair. Yeah, I know this is going to be terrible. We're going to basically we're going to be listening to some uh, some basically listening to Rick Warren's appearance on different uh, programs, the Today Show being one of them, and on Hannity and Combs. Get this on Hannity and Combs, Jesus tell, told Alan Combs to uh, try Jesus for sixty days. Give him a, give Jesus a sixty day trial. <sighs> Ay 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 ay. So we're going to we're going to talk about that, but we're going to ask the basic question. Um does Jesus come with a warranty? Yeah, well apparently he does. Oh. You know, and and not only that, if you act now, if you try Jesus for 60 60 free days, then what we will do is we'll even throw in a free lube and oil and a tire rotation. <laughs> you know, you just don't you, we got to be relevant, man. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to play the, the the Rick Warren appearances. And we're going to play – we're then going to play something from uh, Joel Osteen. Uh, this is a while ago. Joel Osteen appeared on uh, Larry King Live with his wife, uh, uh, Heresy Barbie. And uh, and it, we're going to basically ask the question, what do Joel Osteen and Rick Warren have in common? And uh, that ought to just prove to be all kinds of fun. Um, <laughs> so we'll see how that how that goes. Um but let me set this up for you. Um, Rick Warren of Saddleback Church, the author of The Purpose Driven Life, has uh, written a new best-selling book called The Purpose of Christmas. And he's out you know, doing the, uh, the book tour, making the rounds on all of the news shows. And uh, he appeared on The Today Show. He appeared on Handy and Combs. He appeared on Geraldo last night. Which was really funny because the the way they cut up that uh, the answers to that uh, interview, it wasn't really religious, you know. So you know, I I, I have this is the way Geraldo kind of covered it, although that was really weird. It, there was there was some church choir up there, the Stop Shopping Choir. I kid you not. I should probably bring that in and play that tomorrow. Anyway, so um, this is uh, this is audio from Rick Warren's appearance on the Today Show. And we're just going to ask the question, okay, real quick, you know, Christmas, right? John, you familiar with the story? You know, God himself comes to earth in human flesh, born in a manger, right? Why did Christ come to earth? It wasn't for presents. No, it wasn't for presents. Okay, that's a good (laughs) non-answer. You know, as I read the story, Christ is born. He's God in human flesh. He uh, basically lives his life sinlessly. He lives, you know, to be 33 years old as a man, and he he achieves a sinless, perfectly sinless life, right? And uh, he dies for the sins of the whole world and to propitiate God's wrath. And the call of the gospel is, you know, it, basically, you know, that you know, to repent and believe the good news. So the go- for, so Christmas time is really kind of the first real tangible. Uh, uh, pieces of the story that we get of of God entering history, you know, uh, uh, this good news that unto us is born a savior, right? And uh, which, uh, again, you know, that just even that sentence, you know, unto you is born a savior. There's all kinds of theological implications that go with that. What's a savior, and why do I need one, right? You know, and what's what's the gospel message? Well, let's see how Rick does in his interview on the Today Show. And um, I think he's doing this with Matt Lauer. 
Yeah. Whether it's braving long shopping lines or attending yet another party, the holidays can sometimes feel more like a burden than a celebration. So how do you keep the holiday spirit alive? Oh, well, see, there we go. See, I'm, I'm all partied out already. How do you keep the holiday spirit alive? <laughs> well, that's it. you got to get buy Rick Warren's book, The Purpose of Christmas. That's how you do it. Rick Warren is the pastor of the Lake Forest, California megachurch Saddleback and the author of the bestseller, The Purpose Driven Life. His new book is The Purpose of Christmas. Rick, and you told me to call you Rick. I did. Good morning. Nice to have Good you. Good morning, here. Matt. Thanks. It's, it's, it's amazing. Stress. People always talk about stress at this time of year. i yeah. got to shop. i got to spend yeah. money. i got to go to party. You know, I was complaining about that earlier. This is this is like hitting me. I'm, this was geared right for my demographic, the over-partied fat white guy segment of the U.S. population. This is supposed to be the celebration of the birth of Jesus. Yeah, that's right, Matt. And, you know, the truth is we uh, we often get sidelined by all of the other things. That's, it is a celebration that God sent Jesus to earth to solve our biggest problem. But, okay, okay so God sent Jesus to earth to solve our biggest problem. Well, it depends on how you just, <laughs> how are you defining our biggest problem? I guess I would, you know, I'm sitting there going, okay, so Jesus is the big problem solver from the sky? Okay. It, this is just weird language when it comes to Christianity. Let, let's see how he plays this out. Uh, we often don't accept the gift. You know, if you gave me a Christmas gift. We don't accept the gift? So God sent Jesus as a gift. To solve our biggest problem, we often don't accept the gift. Folks, have you ever heard of Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism? Yep, have you ever heard those terms? Now, being a good Lutheran, okay, Lutherans are confessional. We actually have confessions of faith. And one of our primary confessions of faith is known as the Augsburg Confession. Now, just so you understand here, I'm not saying the Augsburg Confession is... Uh, the Bible. It's not, but I do believe unreservedly that the Augsburg Confession co correctly interprets and summarizes uh, the teachings of Scripture and the central and core doctrines of Christianity. Okay. Now, regarding original sin, this is very interesting. The Augsburg Confession says this. It says, It is also taught among us that since the fall of Adam, all men who are born according to the course of nature are conceived and born in sin. Okay. The, the, remember, the reason why you sin is because you are a sinner by nature. That's what we sinners do. We sin. That is, all men are full of evil lust and inclinations from their mother's womb and are unable by nature to have true fear of God and true faith in God. Okay. Um, moreover, this inborn sickness and hereditary sin is truly sin. And it condemns to the eternal wrath of God all those who are not born according, uh, born again through baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, rejected in this connection are the Pelagians and others who deny that original sin is sin, for they hold that natural man is made righteous by his own powers, thus disparaging the sufferings and merits of Christ. So let, let's get this out on the table here. Christians, we've got to clean up our language here. Okay, so if Jesus came to or to solve our biggest problem and we don't accept the gift, well, um, Rick, by nature we can't accept the gift. That would mean I could somehow make myself right with God by my own merits, by my own efforts. And that's not what the scriptures teach. In fact, um, <clears throat> if you have, if, by the way, you know, let me give you some uh, Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism. Those are some big words. We gotta we gotta unpack them. Pelagianism is a heresy, okay? That uh, and and it was uh, put out there by a monk during the fourth century, and Augustine wrote against Pelagius rather effectively, okay? And so much so that the church rejected Pelagianism, and and, and you know one of its church councils, you know, literally clearly said Pelagianism is a heresy. Pelagianism, just so you know, is the belief that original sin did not taint human nature, which being created from God was divine. You know, that, you gotta listen to that. You got a lot of people out there running around the landscape today saying things like, you were created in God's image. Okay? They, they don't believe that original sin taints human nature. And if you sell, tell somebody who's not a Christian... Yeah. Oh, well, you were creating God's image. You just need to make better decisions. You make need to make a decision for Jesus. That's Pelagius talk. That's Pelagian talk right there. 
okay and that more and that the mortal will is still capable of choosing good or evil without divine aid thus adam's sin was to set a bad example for his uh, progeny but his actions did not have uh, the other consequences imputed to original sin so pelagianism views the role of jesus as setting a good example for the rest of humanity thus counteracting adam's bad example in short humanity it has full control and thus full responsibility for its own salvation in addition to full responsibility for every sin. That's what Pelagianism is, and it's a heresy. It's a rejected heresy. It contradicts the clear words of God. Now, semi-Pelagianism basically says that, okay, well, in, our nat- in, in, in original sin, we, we hurt, we, we wounded um, our, our, our nature so much so that we're almost dead but not quite. We're still capable of responding. And you just got to make a decision. No, that semi-Pelagianism is also rejected. Okay. So um, just so you know, um, semi-Pelagianism is the rampant, predominant teaching in American, in American evangelicalism. Make a decision for Jesus. Choose God. Accept his gift. Things like that. But notice what's missing here in Rick's uh, call here is anything that has to do really with sin, nailing people to the wall for their sin, and then uh, and then calling them to repentance and faith. Okay. Um, so, by the way, there's a couple of passages that are really cool. Um, John six forty four says, "No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day." Well, uh, the Greek word there, at John six forty four, is helkuo. And helkuo, literally, uh, it, it's to move an object from one area to another by pulling motion or drawing with the implication that the object being moved is incapable of propelling itself or in the case of persons is unwilling to do so voluntarily. So um, Jesus in uh, John six forty four says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Imagine, if you would, that we're statues, and this is really the implication of the word helkuo, is that you're a statue and God is taking ropes and throwing them around you and pulling you towards him, okay? And you're not capable of doing so on your own. Or John six sixty five, Jesus, uh, he went on to say that, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him, okay? You, are, you cannot choose God. God chooses you. And how does God draw us? How does God give us faith? It's through the proclamation of the gospel, and I would even say through the means of grace, you know, in baptism, so here we, here we go. Okay, so Rick Warren here is ta- is saying that you know we, we've got this great gift from God, but uh, we're not accepting it. But Jesus came to solve our biggest problem. Well, what's our problem, Rick? What's the problem that God came to solve, or Christ came to solve? And uh, you came over a year later and you said, "How'd you like my gift?" And I go, "Well, I'm sure it's great, but I didn't have time to open it." <laughs> You'd be offended, and I'd miss the blessing of it. And a lot of people go through Christmas and never open the gift, God's gift to us. I don't want to sound like an angel here, and I've been carried away with the commercial side of the holidays just as much as anybody else has. But it's almost as if at every cash register, at every store across the country, you should have the title of your book that says, in question form, what is the purpose of Christmas before you're allowed to charge something on a credit card? Yeah, well, that's the reason I wrote the book. I think it's for, I, I, I wrote it to be given to people to think about uh, whether you're a skeptic or a seeker or a believer. What, what's, why do we do this thing? Why is history divided into A.D. and B.C. by this event? Every, I mean, even people who don't accept uh, Jesus Christ, they still use uh, 2008 as the reference point. Well, but you, you bring up a good point. You say whether you're a skeptic, a cynic, or, or a yeah. believer. Do you have to be a devout Christian to get the true meaning of the holiday? Oh, well, I think so. I think you have to understand that Jesus Christ came for your greatest benefit. It's like unwrapping the gift to him. <sighs> Jesus came for your greatest benefit. Okay. Now we did a full I did a full blown review of uh, this book and explained why I wouldn't recommend it, especially considering the scripture twisting that's involved in this book. But now we've got Rick Warren basically saying that uh, God uh, Christ came to solve your biggest problem and Christ came for your greatest benefit. Me it's me centered. Um Okay. I mean I I Listen, I do sales and marketing. In, in the corporate world, I came up through the sales and marketing ranks. I know all about you know the principle the principle of WIFM. You ever heard of that WIFM? What's in it for me? Okay, when you're selling something, when you're pitching something, when you're marketing a product or service, people want to know what's in it for them, right? Rick Warren here is doing the WIFM approach. What's in it for me? Oh, Christ came for your greatest benefit. Came to solve your greatest problem. Wow, that sounds great. What, well, 
what is my greatest benefit? What is my greatest problem? The bottom line of Christmas is you matter to God. He made you. He loves you. And he sent uh, himself to earth so we could know what he's like. All right, so, so. Send himself to earth so we can know what he's like. God apparently is about, you know, six foot one. Uh, has you know has Jewish facial features and a beard and uh, is a tall and lovable, lovable guy. I've seen the pictures. Yeah, I've seen the pictures. Have you seen Jesus' graduation picture? <laughs> 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 so Christ came to earth to show us what he's like. Wow. Now we know what he's like. And how has that changed me at this point? Uh, not really much. Um <clears throat> Jesus the example? Okay. People are listening to what you just said. You yeah. matter to God. And a lot of people, Rick, as you know, yeah. around the country right now, are facing unemployment. They're yeah. facing foreclosure. Yeah. They can't pay their bills. They won't be able to send their kids to college. And they say, yeah. well, if I matter to God, why yeah. do you put me in this situation? Yeah. How do you answer that to your 20,000-plus sure. congregants? Well, we live on a broken planet. The fact is nothing works here. No relationship. No economy. Uh, it, it's been broken since the beginning. And Why is it broken, Rick? Sin? Can you say the word sin? S I N. The re that's the reason why it's broken is because of our sin. <clears throat> All right, let's continue. That's why we pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because it's done perfectly there. But what we need to do at Christmas time is really focus on people less fortunate than us, too. Not just uh, receiving God's gift of, of salvation, but also saying, How can I make a difference? In Notice that NBC, the Today Show, this is not a Christian network. So he's literally getting in front of a huge, ginormous, non-Christian audience. Okay. Somebody else's life. It, it's, it, you know, Tony Robbins, who's the inspirational yeah. guru there, has that same theory. He says, yeah. if you're really feeling bad about your own straits, go help someone in worse straits. Exactly. Traits. Absolutely. You see, most of the world would love to have our problems. They would love to, uh, they'd love to be in debt. They don't have debt. They don't have any money in, in their pocket. And uh, what if you're depressed, which is the Christmas season is a season where people often get the blues, get stressed out, suicide goes up. You need to do two things. Turn to God and turn to somebody less fortunate than yourself. What turn to God. How are we supposed to do that if, if God is the one who draws us and we can't come to God, Christ or can't come to God unless the Father enables us to do that? This sounds like Pelagianism to me, folks. And notice what's, you know, Rick Warren is in front of a national audience discussing the purpose of Christmas, and we're not hearing about our sin. We're not hearing about Christ's death on the cross. We're not hearing about the, uh, repentance and the forgiveness of sins. No, Jesus came to uh, for our greatest benefit and uh, to solve our biggest problem. And then, you know, just do good things for other people because that will make you feel better. And make it so you won't commit suicide after partying too much in December. One of the major complaints, as I mentioned, you have 20,000 plus yeah. congregants uh, yeah. at, at your church. What's the main complaint? What's the number one you complaint you hear at this time of year? Try you know, the number one complaint at Saddleback, by the way, should be, my pastor twists God's word terribly and he needs to stop doing that. But that's not the biggest complaint. Trying to do too much in too little time. I mean, we just say, let's go write a card to everybody we've ever known. Right. Let's redecorate our house. Let's buy a gift for everybody we've ever known. Uh, let's go to five extra parties. And, and we add all this stuff in. Actually, uh, you could celebrate it in a whole lot simpler way. You know, we're going to have you back, I think, on Christmas Day. We're actually yeah. going to talk more. And I know you want people to ask themselves two questions yeah. on Christmas. And we'll talk about that then. But first, in advance, happy holidays. Thank you. Same to you. Good to have you here. And the book is called The Purpose of Christmas. And to hear more from Rick Warren, be sure to watch his interview with Ann. That's on Dateline, Friday, December 19th. All right, so that was his appearance on the Today Show. In front of a national secular audience, he has this incredible opportunity here. The name of the book is The Purpose of Christmas. It's all about Christ coming to earth. For unto you was born a Savior, right? He could... Talk about all of the biblical themes, all of the gospel theme, themes, sin, rebellion against God, Christ coming to earth, living a perfect life, his righteousness being imputed to us by faith, a call for repentance and forgiveness of sins, and really preaching the gospel, right? 
Uh, well, he didn't even get close. <sighs> Which made me muse on one of my websites that I think it's time that we have a recall. We need to recall Rick Warren because here's the deal. I never voted for who I would like to have representing me as a Christian on, on national television. And since we live in a democracy, I, I think there needs to be a recall. We need to recall Rick Warren and find somebody else who is willing to actually, you know, not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and, uh, and you know, <clears throat> preach it. Um, well, you know, maybe I'm just being negative. Anyway, uh, we're going to take our first break. And when we come back, we're going to pick up uh, we're going to pick up this topic and uh, take a listen to Rick Warren's appearance on the Hannity and Combs show. Again, plugging his book, The Purpose of Christmas. And uh, see how he he did on uh, that appearance. Um, if you'd like to email me regarding anything you've heard so far and tell me how you can choose God, how you really think that the purpose of Christmas is doing something better for somebody else who's less fortunate than you are, or you just like partying and you're depressed and stressed out about it, you can do so. Talk back at fightingforthefaith.com. Talk back at fightingforthefaith.com. We'll be right back. So John and I are talking during the break, and John sometimes has some amazing insights, you know? He says, you know, Chris, Charlie Brown Christmas special, they get it clearer than Rick Warren did. So I'm going, no. It's like, yeah, actually, think about it. Yeah, it's true. So we had to look it up on YouTube. We'll play that here in a second. Okay. By the way, you're listening to Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro, and I am your servant in Jesus Christ. My job on a daily basis is to dish up a daily dose of biblical discernment. And we just choose to ask the question, is this Christianity? Is what the Christian faith teaches, or is it something else? All right? And uh, that's what we do on a daily basis here. And uh, if, if you would like to help support this radio program, the way you do that is by supporting Pirate Christian Radio. And if you would like to send in your year-end gift to Pirate Christian Radio to support Fighting for the Faith, you can by uh, writing us at Pirate Christian Radio at uh, Post Office Box 791, San Juan Capistrano, California, 92693. That's Pirate Christian Radio, Post Office Box 791, SJC, California, 92693. And we could truly use your support for, uh, for this outreach. All right, coming back to the question of, you know, what is the purpose of Christmas? Here we've got Rick Warren. Literally one of the most influential pastors in the world. Uh, there's nobody who's going to say, no, nah, he's not influential like that. No, he's one of the most influential pastors in the world. He's out. Is, do they call it a junket? Or is that what they call it? I don't know. I don't know the real word for that. I, I'm probably going to mess that up. I'm not, you know. I, book tour? Book tour. He's out plugging his book. Okay. And so he's making the rounds. Out on the, you know, uh, out on the, uh, the 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 news shows, and uh, he went on the Today Show, and we didn't hear anything about the real purpose of Christmas. You would think that the most influential pa Christian pastor, one of the most influential Christian pastors in the world, when he was on a news show in front of an audience of a whole bunch of non-believers, would um, exalt Christ and Him crucified, right? That didn't really happen. Let's listen to uh, Linus uh, from the Charlie Brown Christmas special. See how he handles the question of the purpose of Christmas. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? So that's that's Charlie Brown here. He's all upset because this is from the Charlie Brown Christmas special. Charlie Brown is all upset because he's asking the question: Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Okay. So let's 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 hear that again. Let's find listen to the answer here from the peanuts who seem to get it. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. He's now approaching the stage. He's going to announce this to the whole world. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Well, he, uh, there we go. Notice that uh, Linus uh, seems to have pinpointed on Christ. Linus did a far better job in that one minute and 13 seconds than Rick Warren did on four minutes on the Today Show. He quoted scripture. Yeah, he quoted the scripture, too. Yeah. Well, there's an idea. <laughs> well, Rick doesn't know how to do that. He only knows how to twist it. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next interview. And this interview took place on Hannity and Combs. And uh, let's see here. i, I got to make sure I can find it. Uh, here we go. This is Rick Warren on Hannity and Combs. We'll play the whole, uh, the, the, well, the, the full, before, they, the second half of the interview, they got political. We'll play the first half where uh, where he, he's talking about the purpose of Christmas. So uh, here, here's Rick Two Warren. Weeks away from Christmas and as thousands prepare to celebrate it, well, it seems that few know the true meaning of the holiday. But one man who does understand what Christmas is all about is our good friend, Pastor Rick Warren, in his brand new book, The Purpose of Christmas. The Saddleback Pastor explains how Christmas is a time for celebration, salvation, reconciliation, challenges all to make this holiday season one that will change our lives forever. Pastor Rick Warren. I, Good to I, see you, Sean. I love the, past, uh, the, the purpose-driven life. It is, it's, it's impacted my life a lot. Thank you. And this is a great book. This, Thank you. We forget we were all out shopping and New York goes crazy and we turkey and ham. and Do we stop and think about what Christmas is about? You know, it's kind of like uh, with Thanksgiving. Uh, on Thanksgiving, we do everything except give thanks. You know, speak for yourself. We have a great Thanksgiving service at our church. And uh, you know what we did in that? We gave thanks. Because maybe they don't have a Thanksgiving service at Saddleback. I, I don't know. I... <laughs> we, 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 we eat, we watch football, we have a good time with family. Almost nobody gives thanks to God at Thanksgiving, unless there's a short prayer before we eat. Can I ask you, are you as normal as, as what you're describing? or you, Because you're a pastor, yeah. you, you're, you probably are better at this than, say, I am. I'm, I need to do better. Well, you know, in, uh, in uh, uh, the book that I talk about, I said Christmas is a time for celebration. So I'm not against decorating, putting on lights, buying gifts. In fact, the whole reason we give gifts is the wise men gave gifts to Jesus at the first Christmas. You know, what's funny is, is that that's not exactly true. The Issues Etc. just recently talked about the reason why we give gifts. I should put a link up to that Issues Etc. talking about St. Nicholas. Okay, that, that's just a historical point, though. That one can be debated, you know, but okay. And that started the gift-giving process. Right. But we've got to remember why Jesus came to earth. That, it, well, I, and it was for the... Okay, okay. He just said, we've got to remember why Jesus came to earth. I want you to pay real close attention to who answers that question. So let me back it up a little bit. Listen carefully. Who is it? Is it Pastor Rick Warren or somebody else that gives the answer to the question, why Jesus came to earth? Here we go. Give gifts is the wise men gave gifts to Jesus at the first Christmas, and that started the gift giving process. Right. But we've got to remember why Jesus came to earth. That, it, well, I, and it was for the salvation of, of man's soul and reconciliation yeah. to God. You know, if God yeah, wanted, do I have to forgive Alan for Christmas? <sighs> there it was. Kind of that that almost was gospelish from Sean Hannity, who was a, a ro practicing Roman Catholic. Okay, um, a stuttering something about reconciliation, you know, and and stuff like so. That was, folks. I'm telling you, that's about as much gospel as you're going to get in this entire interview. And it wasn't even Rick Warren that was proclaiming the gospel. It was Sean Hannity who threw that kind of in there, almost as an aside. Well, we continue. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I start? Can I say something? <laughs> you know, okay, he got everything he wants this right year. Here, you know, you we know, got Barack Obama elected. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely, you know. 
You know what? I'm 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 bound to be a bridge builder, and I'm here for a reconciliation because America does not want to see you guys split up. Well, he's he he That's abandoned it. me. Blame him. If you can bring us back together, then you really are gifted. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. He wants to wait for me that bad. No, 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 no. But in all honesty, as a Christian, you know what? I, you know what I find? I just took a few days vacation. I'll yeah. take some time around Christmas, and when you stop, I you begin to realize, you know what? We we go at a pretty fast pace. Yeah. And we don't really stand back and reflect a lot. And you, this book yeah. makes you reflect yeah. and think of the real purpose and meaning of life and things. Well, part of it is, uh, one of the ideas I try to get across is uh, opening God's Christmas gift to you. If you gave me a Christmas gift... You know, this is very similar to what we heard on the Today Show. Opening God's Christmas present to you. Okay. Well, God's Christmas present to me was Christ. It was himself. Okay, he he gave me the gift of a savior. Let's see if we get to that. He, does he even get to Linus level? You know. And I never opened it. And a year later, you go, "Hey, Rick, do you like my gift?" And I go, "Oh, well, Sean, I'm I'm really glad you gave it to me. Unfortunately, I was too busy to open it." You go, "What kind of friend are you?" And and first, I miss the benefit. Pack your bags. You're going on a guilt trip. Um, see, there's God up there going, "Man, I gave you this great present, and you never even opened it. What kind of friend are you?" It, you know he's he's trying to do a more friendly approach here, and you just got God coming off as somebody who's been you know slighted. You know, dude, I you know I, I gave you this great pres Christmas present, you didn't even open it, man. What's wrong with you? Oh 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 I'm, oh I'm sorry, God. Let me go open that up. You know, that, will that make you feel better? Will that get you to stop nagging me? But the gift, and second, uh, you're kind of a little ticked off because I didn't open it. God has given us a gift in Jesus Christ, and people don't understand. It's for our benefit. One of the things. Hey, there it is. It's, okay, he's given us a gift in Jesus Christ, and it's for our benefit. Technically, this is correct. Proof is always in the pudding. How is he defining that? If I'm a non believer and I'm listening to Hannity and Combs, okay, I'm watching this, uh, you know, one night uh, while he's on the Fox News, okay, am I going to hear the gospel clearly presented? Right? That's the question. Things that says, for unto you is born this day a Savior. All right. They say, well, I don't need a Savior. Well, believe me, if you didn't need one, God wouldn't have sent it. Well, that, that's true. That's true. Okay, good, good, good. Why do I need a Savior? Because uh, because he wouldn't have wasted the time. Oh, and, and Jesus because he wouldn't have wasted the time. Jesus meets every one of our deepest needs. And what we need... Jesus meets every one of our deepest needs? Have you have you ever seen the, that uh, ha, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs? No. I, I should look this up. So stick with me a second, folks. Um, Maslow hierarchy. Hierarch. Maslow hierarchy. There's there's this thing called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There we go. Let's see here. All right. uh, Jesus came to meet all of our deepest needs, a uh, physiological need. Okay, so according to Maslow, you know, the, the, you know, this is this idea that uh, you know, there's all these different needs that we have. By the way, this isn't biblical at all. But you know, Jesus came to fulfill all of our deepest needs. Okay. Well, according to uh, Maslow, there's a hierarchy of needs that we have. We got the physiological needs. That means we have a need for breathing. Yeah, I need to breathe. How about you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just checking. Food, water, sex, sleep, homostasis, and uh, and uh, and and you know, bowel movements, excretion. So we have physiological need. So here's the deal: if you if you if you're not meeting these very basic needs, you're not going to care about the stuff that's above it. Okay. After that, you know, you have a need for security of the body, of employment, of resources, of morality, of the family, of health, and of property. So Jesus came for all of those needs too, right? Okay, Jesus came for all of our needs, our deepest needs. Friend, and, and after that, you got the the needs of love and belonging. You got friendship, family, uh, intimacy. Okay, and then you got above that, you got esteem, confidence, achievement, respect of others, respect by others. And then after that, you got morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem solving, lack of prejudice, acceptance of facts. You know, that's in the self actualization portion of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So Jesus came to meet our deepest needs. Is he referring to Maslow here? What's he referring to? This isn't exactly biblical language, so I'm, I'm having a tough time tracking with him. Let me back it up a little bit and so we can hear him in context. 
And we'll continue on with uh, Rick Warren talking about the purpose of Christmas on Hannity and Calms. God wouldn't have sent it because, uh, because he wouldn't have wasted the time. And, and Jesus meets every one of our deepest needs. And what we need to do is accept his gift of our past forgiven, purpose for living, home in heaven. Hey, Pastor. Okay, so there it is. Jesus' gift is a past forgiven, purpose for living, and a home in heaven. Really? Is it just my past that's forgiven? What about my present? What about my future? And what's this purpose for living stuff? Okay. Past forgiven, purpose for living, home and It sounds Christian-ish, but we have to accept the gift. Uh, you know, in a Pelagian or semi-Pelagian way. Did you just say peed off? You know, no, I didn't say that. I can't believe you said I might have. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me ask you, you. You talk about, okay, so you think everybody needs a Savior. I do. But what about those people who don't, you know, not all, I happen to be Jewish, not yeah. everybody. Yeah. I know Jesus, by the way, and I have a lot in common with the same religion. Absolutely. So not everybody necessarily goes that route. Well, see, is that the thing the, is, Alan, I believe Jesus Christ came for everybody. I don't think... Okay, now, this is, this is, again, this is one of those ones where it just, something feels wrong in it, Okay. Alan Combs, who's a liberal and he's Jewish, has basically said, "Are you sure everyone needs a savior? You know, I'm Jewish. Jesus and I had the same religion, and and you know, and that's kind of the direction he's going. You know, do, does everyone have to accept Jesus? Kind of thing." And Rick Warren, I'll give him kudos for the fact that he um, will affirm the exclusive claims of Christ. But I mean, up in, when he was dealing with Sean Hannity, who was an obvious fan of his. Who's you know got a lot from the purpose driven life and all the scripture twisting that goes on in that book? Um, you know, threw him some softball questions. He had all this opportunity to proclaim Christ and the gospel and the real purpose of Christmas. And what it boiled down to is your past forgiven, a purpose for living in a home in heaven. And now we got Alan Combs asking the logical follow up questions. Wait a second, does everyone need a savior? Okay, well let's see what Rick does with this. He came for Christians. Uh, the yeah. Bible says, uh, "Take this good news." To- all right, let me back it up because that that didn't sound right the way that got chopped. Because he doesn't. He, all right, let's. Here we go. It necessarily goes that route. Well, see, that- the thing is, Alan, I believe Jesus Christ came for everybody. I don't think he came for Christians. Uh, yeah. The Bible says, uh, "Take this good news to the whole world." I don't care whether you're Baptist, Buddhist, uh, Mormon, uh, Methodist, Jewish, uh, Muslim, or no religion at all. Jesus Christ still loves you. You still matter to God. Uh, true. And I- well, okay, okay, this is all well and good. Granted, okay, Christ died for the sins of the world. Okay. But this whole idea of Christ didn't come just for Christians, that's kind of a silly way of talking, isn't it? Because everyone who trusts in Christ is a Christian. Christian is a designation, a term that we use to describe somebody who trusts in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and believes that Christ is their Savior and trusts in Him exclusively. It's somebody who is a, you know, Jesus Christ, a Christian, right? So saying that oh, Jesus didn't come just for Christians, it's kind of a slippery way of dealing with the language in the first place. No one's a Christian unless they trust in Christ. You can self-identify as a Christian all you want. If you don't believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus, you're not a Christian. So a Christ, the term Christian is a term designated for somebody who trusts in Christ, has faith and belief in Christ. They're believers. So I don't really find his little play on words to be all that useful, but it is important to note that Christ died for the sins of the whole world. We are to go and preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, right? Okay. So, all right, let's continue. I think that's a wonderful message, but if you don't accept Jesus, if you're not somebody who goes that route religiously, can you find your way to heaven? Can you still be going to the same place when it's all said and done? I'm not the authority on that, but I believe Jesus is. And everybody's betting their life on something. Jesus said, I am the way. Okay. Okay. Half answer. And it's kind of a weaselly little answer. You know, it's like he's, he's trying to dodge the implications of what this says. Hang on a second. We're... Got to open up the old computerized Bible here. By the way, I'm, I'm going to be trying out a new version of the computerized Bible very shortly here. Um, Logos has got a, a whole set of uh, software that they've come out with finally for the Macintosh. 
So um, I've got that. I've got that in order, and I'm going to give it a try. So I, I may not be faithful to Accordance anymore. But see, but see, then do I send one of my computers to that? Never mind. <laughs> Anyway, all right. So, uh, I am the way. Okay, let's let's read this um, in context. Okay. All right. Let's see. All right. So Jesus, he's quoting this. I am the way. Okay. This is John fourteen, starting in verse two. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I I, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Oh Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can you say that we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except for through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father. And from now on, you do know him. So here's the deal. He quoted the. He only quoted half the passage. Jesus says, "I am the way." It's more than that, Rick. It's Jesus says that no one comes to the Father except for through Him. Okay, you, you're right in saying that it's not your decision, or you know, the, you, maybe he's you know he's saying, "Well, I'm not the authority on that." Jesus is. I I think it's smart of him to put this on Jesus' shoulder and basically say, "But give us the full counsel here." Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. There is no other way." And you know, and really punch it. You know, let's let's get the whole thing in here. But let's see what he does now. Betting yeah. is he's not a liar. Well, I, okay. I'm betting okay. that he that he told right. the truth. But what about what does it say for all those people who do not accept Christ as their personal savior? I'm saying that this is the perfect time to open their life to give it a chance. I'd say give him a 60 day trial. Is that? <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, you heard that right. Okay. Pelagianism, at best, this is, this is not even right. Hang on a second here. Let me back this up because it's just, here we go. Accept Christ as their personal Savior. I'm saying that this is the perfect time to open their life to give it a chance. I'd say give them a 60-day trial. Is that a yeah, okay. 60, 60 day trial? Like, 60 day trial. Sounds like the book of the See month if he'll change your life. I dare you. <laughs> See if he'll change your life. I dare you. Give Jesus a 60 day trial. See if he doesn't change your life. I dare you. Whew, there's some prophetic preaching right there. I'm, you know, I just got. No, I didn't. Yeah, I was going to say I got goosebumps, but really I didn't. I got angry. Um,. Is is this what we're now reduced to? In our efforts to be seeker sensitive, not offend anyone, hurt their self esteem, we're now asking people to give Jesus a sixty day trial. Try Jesus. You know what's funny about this is that you know when I think about that, one of the things that comes to mind is those guys who say, you know what, I don't know if I want to get married to that girl. Got to try her out first. Let's shack up. So this is like the, the the evangelistic version of shacking up with Jesus for 60 days and see if Jesus doesn't change your life. I dare you. What's this life change bit about? Where is sin? Where is repentance? Where's the forgiveness of sins? Where's the call to repentance? Where's the call to faith? Where's the where, 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 where's the law in any of this? It's no, 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 no. You just... You see, it's all about this benefit stuff. You know, you got your past forgiven, a purpose for living in a home in heaven. See, it's all positive, 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 positive. Nothing negative. Oh, no, 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 nothing negative. No, 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 no. But, you know, and, you know, so here, Alan Combs has asked him an honest, upright, academic question. If you are not a Christian, what's going to happen to you? The biblical answer is, well, then you need to face God via your own righteousness. You're going to have to stand before God and give an accounting of your life based upon your righteousness. How well have you done at the Ten Commandments? I've done a pretty miserable job myself. Um, but, yeah, you see, give Jesus a 60-day trial. Good night. We're going to go into our second break. When we come back, we're going to continue with this. And then we're going to ask the question, what does Rick Warren have in common with Joel Osteen? What's this? Uh, see if he doesn't make your life better stuff, because that's really kind of what's going on here. Um, anyway, um, we'll be we'll be right back. Um, if you would like to email me. That was a little loud. 
<laughs> if you would like to email me and let me know about your giving Jesus 60 days, you know, a chance to see if he changed your life. And how did it go? You know, I think about the poor guy out in the uh, in Saudi Arabia who gives Jesus a try for 60 days and ends up dead, martyred. His life sure did change, didn't it? To room temperature. You can email me. Talk back at fightingforthefaith.com. We'll be right back. <laughs> 